We are going. Welcome, everybody. This is the Life Enthusiast online radio and TV Blab Network coming to you live from Vernon, British Columbia and Medellin, Colombia. I'm Scott. He's Martin. Welcome to the show. Hey, Martin, how are you doing? You're the Life Enthusiast health coach, and we're going to be talking about the pro-GMO train that's running off the tracks today. So GMO is always one of our favorite topics. So how are you doing today and what's up? I'm good, and what's up is I am just really concerned because it's just making its way through the U.S. Senate, and uh, I, if people are not aware of it, they need to pummel, pummel, pummel their senators with phone calls and messages because they are bought and paid for, and they need to be told that if they vote this in, they're gone. Because if they're not gone, well, anyway, it will be too late. Once they make it a law, it's a law. And what they're going to make into a law is that Vermont, which that has voted in a GMO labeling law that's going to kick in on July 1st, is going to be told, no, nope, you can't have it. It gets unwound. So truth in advertising depends on who's advertising. It depends who you can buy. I'm going with. I'm going with Mark Twain, who in 1905 famously said, we have the best government money can buy. He knew even then, eh? I probably, it was probably true even then. I don't know. Yeah. But so in 2013, there was a ballot campaign, which means I think that some normal person went to the government and said, there's an election. I want this on the ballot. And if it gets a certain number of petitions or whatever, then it, Gets theirs. It gets theirs, right? And this ballot was to label genetically modified orgasms, GMOs, in Washington state. So the Grocery Manufacturers Association said, mm, you know what, we have so much GMO in so many of the products that our members are producing that that might not be a very good idea. So let's uh, do what we can to squash it. And history says, they won the campaign, the uh, ballot. It was something like 51 to 49. It was a very, very, very close. But so what, what's come up, so something has come up now about uh, their behavior. So what was that, Martin? Um, I Well, what what's really happening is that they're being sued successfully, I believe, for their transgression because you're not allowed to get out-of-state money into an within state legislative issues. So this GMA, Grocery Manufacturers Association, of whom many of the bigger companies are members, have uh, financed, poured money heavily into this political process. So they essentially broke the law by millions, millions right. of dollars, and caused this thing, the opinion, to shift through their advertising, which then overpowered the grassroots movement because after all we know that advertising works that's why lots of money is spent on advertising and somehow the fear uncertainty and doubt won the day right so the grocery manufacturing association resorted to illegal money laundering schemes in order to protect the identity of the members who donated funds to the opposing campaign because what happened i think it was in california they had a similar issue and of course coca-cola and safeway and all the albertsons and all these major companies were yeah we've donated a hundred thousand a million dollars to the anti-gmo labeling campaign and of course what happened was the 48 or 49 percent of the population that cared enough to vote for again for the labeling voted with their dollars to go someplace else and yep. uh, and they didn't want that to happen again because, they, I mean, it's just like, let's just write up this script, let's make this play, and let's all pretend that it's just, you know, everybody uh, is getting along fine. And, and as, as opposed to the situation where you have, uh, we want to manipulate everybody, but we don't want anyone to know that we're manipulating them. So it's kind of like having a Coca-Cola commercial and advertisement paid by the Martin Patella Health Fund of British Columbia, Canada. <laughs> you know, like, what? are you serious? Like, so uh, there's this huge backlash, which means that 
they're scared and they're on their on the run. And so uh, it's, all in PR. it's all PR. So October 16th, 2013, the Attorney General Bob Ferguson filed suit against the Grocery Manufacturers Association on behalf of the state of Washington, alleging that the association had violated the state's campaign disclosure laws, which I mean, really, we we want there's nothing worse than all of the votes looking like they're rigged, <laughs> right? So, so yet, we need. That's what they are. And that's what they are. So, um, according to Ferguson, the GMA began plotting and planning how to best defeat Initiative Two Five Two Two back in December of 2012, placing particular emphasis on the establishment of a separate GMA fund to combat current threats and better shield individual companies from attacks. So what they found was documents relating to the documents, and they've unsealed these documents now, that includes internal memoir, uh, memos and emails and documents from the GMA that yes. said that, you know, basically we've put together a systematic effort to conceal the sources of $11 million in contributions to post initiative 522. And well, let's, they, not, let's not get so technical here. I mean, this is such legalese. The main point is the big guys have set up a front and they use the front to hide themselves from the front. But it's sort of like the guy who goes into the brothel but doesn't really want his children to know that he does. And then at <laughs> home at dinner, he says, oh, oh, it's a bad thing. Don't you people do that. But, <laughs> but anyway, so that's that issue. But we are having with a current problem, which is just going through the Senate right now, not back in 2013. It's going on right now where it's called DARK, D-A-R-K which is, whew, I forget what the heck it stands for, but it's something to the extent of not letting people know what's in the food and states not being able to legislate about it and people not being able to have a vote or a voice about it. Right. We still have the choice, right? We consumers still have the power and the power is this unless it explicitly says on the bag that it is GMO free, I'm not buying it. Right. That's the other way of doing it, right? Like the GMO free people can all label it GMO free. However, this legislation that is when pending, pending. Oh, well, it's just going through the process is going to ban this kind of statement. Like you would not be able to mention GMO on the packaging. Now that is absolutely wild. So Martin, you, you bring up a question for me and that is, if something is organic, can it be a GMO product? Probably not. I don't know the fine details of how right. organic legislation works, right? Like there are rules written up about what organic is or is not. Right. I know that you're not allowed to use herbicides, pesticides, and other nasty things. So the, a lot of the reason for the GMO experimentation that goes on is, I think, twofold. One was to increase yield, and the second one was to increase resistance to herbicides and pesticides. Yes. So, the, you know, the, the whole point of it being GMO was that you could pour more pesticides and herbicides on it and it would still grow and the fruit would look good or the seed would look good and, and all the rest of it. So, uh, Well, GMO is done with under the flag of greater yields, which they have not been able to produce. That's That's been a failure. They keep repeating this lie in TV. The pundits who speak, they'll say, we have greater yields and we're saving people from hunger. Not true. No data to support it. The other wonderful gaffe that they're putting out there is it's safe. There is, I mean, under FDA rules, it's deemed to be effectively or essentially identical. Right. To the non-GMO. Well, so in France, a group of scientists decided to test this and they started feeding rats corn that's GMO grown. And they started producing some really nasty looking 
tumors and problems in the rats. And their study was first published, then viciously attacked. They were sued into having to take it out or off. And then somehow in France, because French are not all that pro-American, they have managed to say, no, this is real data. This is not a lie. We're publishing this. So this data is online. You can find it. You can, if you, you can look at French GMO uh, corn study with rats. You'll find it. <laughs> and the pictures are very discouraging. And you bring up a really good point because when you do experimentation, uh, unfortunately, much of the science that gets, hap that gets done today is what we call pseudoscience in that we set up the parameters so that it gives us a result that we're looking for as opposed to, well, I'm really curious if X plus Y equals something good or bad. And what happens in a lot of the experimentation is, is that they say, okay, we're going to feed these rats a whole bunch of GMO food and everything else, and we feed them for 10 days uh, because we know that at two months, they get tumors, but we're just going to do it for 10 days. And oh yeah, they're running around. They're happy. They're no problem at all. And so we, this is, you know, this very short term period where we get a sample that tells you something that's very different than if you have a long term period. So it's, it, and it's becoming more and more like I've been reading a number of books lately about the unscientific scientific community. And it's just really, really sad how, you know, it's kind of like, you, you know, you trust your priest and all of a sudden you find out that he's not really all that trustworthy or you, you know, you, you trust a policeman and you find out all of a sudden he's been stealing from somebody. It's just, you, there are certain people that we've been trained and, and told and taught to trust, you know, science is all about getting to the truth and learning more about our society and our world and, and the experimentation and everything else. And then you get into it and you find out there's massive egos involved. And unfortunately there's massive dollars involved too, which causes huge problems. Because if you have a patent on something that Monsanto uses in order to make a GMO corn, and you're a scientist, and then you, of course you're going to be telling everybody, like, this is corn is great. They use my patented process to do this, 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 and it's really good. Uh, whereas we call that conflict of interest, but nobody brings that up and talks about it. And you know, why are you so pro this or so anti that? Well, the fact that I happen to have a patent that you know, brings me in $100 million a year uh, is not something that we should be talking about. Of course it is, but we don't. So then we never know where the people are coming from or why it is they're saying what it is they're saying. So then who do you believe? And of course, the whole thing collapses when we have no arbitrator that can just say, oh, this is a fair and well done study. All these peer review studies that we hear about, we think, oh, other scientists have looked at it and agreed. And then you start looking into it deeper and you know, it was his buddy and he peer reviewed yours and you peer reviewed his. So you both got it peer reviewed and then now you, you're millionaires. Thank you very much. Yeah. And it gets really complicated. So here goes GMO corn. We have NAFTA, which is a North American free trade agreement. Under that, Mexicans were not able to set up a trade barrier against the uh, U.S. grown GMO corn. So GMO corn is flooding the Mexican market. Previously, uh, subsistence farmers growing organic, old-fashioned corn. They get underpriced by a factor of two or three because their, their production methods are small scale and, and so on. Anyway, so in the process of this, maybe one and a half million Mexican farmers lose their livelihood because they can no longer sell their corn. So where do they end up? Either in the drug trade or just crossing the border into the United States because there's nothing for them to do in Mexico. So, so who pre created a problem, right? We have legislated an advantage through the NAFTA trade agreement and through the uh, Monsanto, whatever, you know, genetically modified corn and all of that, and the subsidies that we have put on growing of corn, 
And finally, all of that creates us this production advantage, price advantage. We sell more corn. Guess what happens? Whatever we bought it. out on the other side of this equation is coming to bite us back in the tush. Oy, oy, oy. Okay, so why are we so up in arms about GMOs? I think it's important to mention. I mean, I talked about some French scientists feeding corn to rats and finding them to grow tumors. There are many un solved issues. Why is it that we have these rising levels of chronic inflammatory disease? Autism on the rise, multiple sclerosis on the rise, cancer on the rise, digestive problems, all allergies, you name it. All of that sort of stuff is rising. Is it just the GMO? I cannot say, but it's certainly part of the equation. I would like to have the choice of knowing that I'm eating foods that are not GMO. I don't know if the consumers all around me are getting the message. Most likely not, because there is a price advantage. Like it's cheaper to buy the, uh, I don't know what, corn chips, $1.89 a bag, versus the organic corn chips, which is $5 a bag or something like that. Anyway, there are multiple foods that I want to mention that are on this list that are GMO and have to be off the list. Corn and anything made of corn, which means uh, uh, HFCS, high fructose corn syrup, starch, thickeners, enzymes, all kinds of things that are pulled out of corn. Um, the other one is soy. Really bad news. There, There isn't soy in North America, from Canada all the way down to Argentina that you can purchase that is not contaminated with GMO. We used to we used to use lecithin made from soy in our products that we make in Exula brand. And uh, we were originally able to buy organic soy lecithin. Then they said, we cannot no longer guarantee you organic, but we can guarantee you species specific. They were able to test after they made it and confirm that there is not the GMO in it. But that, that was about as good as they could make it. And uh, we eventually just gave up on it and switched to European sunflower seed lecithin because um, we can be sure of that, that it's not going to cause these nutritional and then later genetic issues. So anyway, corn, soy, Sugar beet has been genetically modified. So most sugar that is uh, sold in North America is <laughs> beyond reach. So anything that has sugar in it, anything that has HFCS in it, by extension, bad news. So you're, you cover on. you're covering just about everything anyone's eating. Just about. I mean, the grocery stores are now poison pits. It's it's really bad. And of course, so some of us are genetically inferior. I'm one of those people. Um, How about you're the canary in the coal mine? That's the way I prefer to look at it. It's like you're the leading edge. And it's kind of like you and, and your family in, in particular, I think, are very, very sensitive to what's going on so that, because I mean, when I grew up and when I was going to school, I didn't have to worry about bringing a peanut butter sandwich to school. I brought a peanut butter sandwich to school all the time. Yep. Was, in fact, it was most of what I ate growing up was peanut butter sandwiches. Now, if, if I was eight years old and my mom gave me a peanut butter sandwich, I'd be sent home because that could have killed some people in my class. So right. in the process of 30 odd years or maybe 40 odd years, we've gone to some, from something that was eaten all the time to something that is now killing people on the school ground. Why is that? Yeah. Well, that, 
you know, so if we'd have been listening to whatever the canary in the coal mine was 40 years ago and changed things, like there's no genetic reason for all of a sudden the human race is allergic to peanuts. No, it's some combination of things that's caused something in us to be very sensitive to it. Yeah. And then, then there is the gluten, gluten sensitivity. Wheat is not specifically genetically modified. It's been hybridized. But the hybridized wheat is uh, causing plenty of problems. I mean, I have problem with it. Whenever I get gluten, I, uh, I get sore. My belly swells up and uh, my skin breaks out on my face. But my daughter is so sensitive that this is just nuts. She says, I get kissed by a guy who drank a beer earlier that evening. And that was enough to cause a gluten flare. Wow. And her gluten flare is that, she, I mean, her, her symptoms are pretty awful. She, she tends to go into the head issues. So she gets migraines and vertigo. So she could spend three, four days in just a horrendous shape, unable to function. Brain fog is another classic symptom of this inflammation. So this is not funny. Um, I mean, I, you and I both are supporting the uh, the group uh, on the Facebook. Right, our fibromyalgia that, support group. Right. That has, uh, um, I mean, in general, people there are reporting that they, their symptoms are brain fog. They're unable to function, not remembering things, not able to recall things. That's common. Pain in various parts of the body. Right. That would be either the migraine side of things where they have piercing pains in their head or in their jaw or they have vision problems, unable to focus, double vision or unable to actually clearly see. And then there is the uh, the rest of the body, like some people have low back pain, which means that it ends up shooting down into the legs and whatnot. And then the third group is the joints, where you have carpal tunnel syndrome or plantar fasciitis. Carpal tunnel when your wrists go away or start failing. And plantar fasciitis when the structure in your feet starts to collapse. So you get flat foot and other issues, just pain. So all of these conditions are essentially inflammatory breakdowns of the body. And the common link to that is number one, this genetic proclivity. Here's, here's the interesting part. The genetics, about um, half of American population has this gene. At least, at least one of the parents have it. And about a third of the population has both parents with it. And so what that does, it lowers your ability to methylate. Undermethylation causes you lesser ability to convert food into energy, which means that you don't have stamina. Instead of being able to run all day long chasing the buffalo or the deer or whatever, you can do sprints, but you cannot do long distance running. So you, you have a short spurt of energy, but you have to feed yourself again. So that's the uh, conversion. And the other one is the detoxification capacity. You are less capable of detoxing, which means that toxins accumulate. So over time, you get worse and worse. I, I mean, it has some benefits. The same genetics also uh, up your... Uh, uh, intellect and uh, linguistic talents and musical talents and uh, so it, it's actually awesome you you could be high achieving in many ways but suffer terribly physically and if we look ahead generationally this is something that's just going to get worse and worse and worse yeah that's it's already I mean I see it I see how my mother or my mother's generation is compared to me and then i'm comparing it to my children and uh, in general they are worse off than i was and i am worse off than my mother was right and it's a lot of it is man-made 
I mean, it's oh. not like you're a pot smoking, drunk, al you know, alcoholic, drug abuser, you know, mm. up till partying all times and, you know, smoking cigarettes and everything else, right? I mean, no. this isn't this isn't like I've created a lifestyle that is really a terrible lifestyle and now I'm paying the price of it. This is, I'm doing what everyone said you should do. Like I'm going to see my doctor and going to see my dentist. I'm going to the grocery store and getting food. I'm drinking water. I might have a beer, you know, on Friday night with the boys and I watch the hockey game. And I mean, this is our lifestyle, right? And mm -hmm. what we're seeing is that lifestyle is a very, deadly lifestyle so the young guy at 18 that lives that lifestyle has a bunch of beer goes to the football game you know and there are millions and millions and millions of them in the united states and canada and around the world i mean i'm in colombia and last night two nights ago the colombian national team played the Peruvian national team. It was on TV, and I just happened to go out to a restaurant to eat. Of course, they all have TVs, and I thought, oh, it's the national team, and yeah, we're all excited. I was wearing green, which was the national team colors, so I fit right in. And <laughs> you know, the place just packed up with all these, you know, twenty-something-year-old people who had three or four beer and ate a bunch of food and cheered on, and then they went and did whatever they did afterwards. I didn't stay to find out, but. You know, that is the lifestyle that we're all supposed to be enjoying. And what you're telling me is, is that in 20 years, we're going to be in a huge amount of pain because all of our bodies are going to be dropped, you know, falling apart because of this. So I'm talking to the 18 to 25 year olds right now. Those of us that are in our 40s, 50s and 60s are already seeing like, oh, my God, I wish I hadn't had that beer when I was. And you know the yeah the beer wasn't a great thing, but the real problem was the everyday food, the stuff that was coming. You know, like my my critical breakdown was uh, mercury poisoning. That's what took me down. Up until that, I was pretty strong. Um, you just talked about corn, and we all ate taco chips. I mean, that is the big food. thing that you oh, eat. So we're yes, just. Sir chowing down on that GMO stuff like it's going out of style. And so, the sugar, of course, that sweetness, right? We love our sweets, so we're going to be eating the, if we're not in the salty and savory, we're in the sweet. Right. So anyway, to, to um, bring it back to the beginning of what we're really discussing here is that we have a problem. We have a political process that goes totally against the interest of the people who are supposedly being represented by the representatives. So the truth is the representatives are representing the money that puts them back in. And the money that puts them back in is really political money that uh, comes in the form of lobbying or in the form of uh, campaign finance. I guess we're uh, at this point watching the uh, the uh, nomination uh, hearings going all around the United States where uh, the Republicans are trying to decide how to uh, cope with <laughs> Donald Trump, which is, um, I guess, I guess people, the, the, the nation is saying, well, you know, all of you are for sale. He is not. I don't care that he talks crazy. What I like about him is that he's not for sale. So let's go with that. Although it's it's just, uh, I mean, the things he says just astound me. Well, don't forget, he is a reality TV uh, star. And he knows from doing that, uh, The Apprentice for five or 10 years or how long he was on it, what it takes to rile up his constituents, what it takes to get people to move, what it get, takes to get them excited and everything else. And mm -hmm. uh, like everybody else in the world, he's, he's very, very inconsistent. And I had the opportunity to watch uh, a favorite comedian of mine interview Larry King. 
And one of the questions that he had was, Larry, you've interviewed Donald Trump a lot. And I just can't believe, you know, that you would spend time with a racist like him. And he looked at he looked at the interview. That was a very good interview. I really liked it. But he said, you know what? Donald Trump is not a racist. And it, he may project that sort of thing and he may be playing a part and he may be doing it. He says, but I know Donald Trump. Donald Trump is not a racist. And I thought, oh, very interesting. So we have this public figure that's very okay. different from the private figure. And I think right. the interesting about Donald is he likes to uh, he likes to to play this part, and what that means, and of course, what that means is is that when he actually wins, if he actually won, you would have no clue what you were actually getting, right? You're getting this crazy man that wants to build a wall across. Uh, Mexico and the United States <laughs> or are you getting somebody that's you know gonna run you know are you gonna get the guy that was eight billion dollars in debt or at one point going through bankruptcy or are you gonna get the guy that created a business that mm -hmm. actually created a lot of income for yeah. him and a lot of okay other people? so what we who know what we're right? saying is that he may be actually quite decent on the inside just putting on a show yeah okay well so if that's what it is. yeah because he, because he knows how to present himself in the. I mean, he has to go against all of these Republican guys, and then he has to go against all of these Democratic guys, and he's got to make himself look different than everybody else, and that's what he's doing. Of course, it reminds me of uh, an interview I uh, listened to with this wrestler, right? And the wrestler said, "I go into an arena, and they boo me like crazy. I'm happy." I go into an arena and they cheer me like crazy. I'm happy. I go into an arena and they're dead quiet. They don't care. Okay, yeah. I'm dead. <laughs> like I'm out of a job, right? Doesn't matter if they love me. Doesn't matter if they hate me. But it matters if they just could care. I mean, if they're going for a beer in my match, I've got a big problem. And so I sometimes suspect that Donald looks at it and he says, you know what? There's people on this side. There's people on that side. People on that side, I'm going to irritate them as much as I can because okay. these people will we'll, laugh we'll, and have We'll fun find out it. how it turns out. And I don't know that he will he goes, be nominated, right? and I don't know if he stands a chance of being elected, but it's it's interesting. <laughs> he certainly would have a lot of people running for yeah. the doors, and, and not necessarily uh, – yeah, I'm thinking of, you know, of, you know Monsanto could be part, running for the doors. If he yeah, got I don't know. the other who part knows? is that, of course, or the they could be happy. As power as no? we think it does. I mean, look at Obama. He came in with all these promises of cleaning yes. up this, that, and the other. And what did he do? Nothing. Nothing. I mean, he accomplished. What did he accomplish? What is his legacy? I I can't point to anything. Big that that he promised to do and did, because he was of course being what's the word uh, limited by the Congress, right? Well, there is a system, and the problem is the system. The problem isn't really the people in. The, maybe it's the people in the system, but <laughs> as a talk to me guy says. Yeah, the president is like the captain of the Titanic. <laughs> oh, it could be. <laughs> yes, absolutely. The thing's going that way. There's a big piece of ice in the way. We can't do anything. Maybe. I don't know. Go down I mean, it's, the ship. it's um... <laughs> yes. I think the problem is systemic. And, you know, I've talked to a lot of people who said, oh, you know, I can't believe these bureaucrats are so dumb or these, they did this, it was so dumb. And I'm thinking, no, you know, they're really pretty smart. And the fact that we think that what they did was wrong or dumb okay. or everything else is because we don't understand what it and was they said. And what I want to say to about accomplish. it is this, this entire society, right. and I've done a lot of analysis, is short-sighted, myopic. It's yes. the difference between strategic and tactical. Yes. I see that in the health in industry. That's where I deal with it all the time. But it's it's in everything. Banking, finance, manufacturing, everybody's too short term. And even, even at the government level, things 
well, I should say this way. In management consulting, we knew that whatever is measured is what gets done. So if we're measuring things by dollars, all we get is results that are measured in dollars. If we're not measuring quality of life, satisfaction, happiness, uh, whatever, whatever, those things just fall off. And if we're measuring 90 days timeline as opposed to 10 year time, timeline, what we're going to get is results that are short termist in, in focus. So I will no longer care for the long range outcome. And that's anyway, that's that's what I see in the government yep. where uh, I, everybody's thinking the next election and the next vote. Yep. And it, they, don't, they don't care about also, the deep thing. Decisions that are made are usually like in Canada, for example, there you have to take the municipal government into consideration. You have to take the provincial government into consideration you have to take the federal for certain things. Right. And a great example yeah. is and it's a problem in the United States is the rights with the First Nations. So I talked to somebody that I knew that was fairly high up in the. I don't know what they call the department, the Department of Native Affairs or something like that at the provincial level. OK, so they mm -hmm. had to negotiate with the native. Country, Local. whatever they want, whatever you call them, the tr you know, a tribe is what I would call them now. They're the first nation, yeah. a first nation nation and the federal government. And he said the, she said the problem he or she <laughs> said the problem was the government I work for changed. And so it took us a year to kind of get the new people up to speed on what was going on. Because don't forget, I'm talking to a bureaucrat who's there throughout the whole thing. And to make sure that we we're going in the direction the new government wanted. So by the time we were up to snuff, the, the natives had an election and a new chief was put in place. So it took him a year to get up. So, yeah. we, so we were ready, they were ready, and then the federal government was having an election and they had a change of government or a change of policy or whatever. And so it took and them, like, and then, so now we're back to an election. And she says, that's what happens. We just go through this round and round thing and then it's a miracle we ever get a treaty signed because all three parties are all in three different stages of the treaty process and never at the same one where they're able to say, okay, let's do this. And there has to be a bit, that's the system. So there has to be a better way of doing that, which is, you know, you and I, I'm sure we could brainstorm three different ways. It would be way better to do this than the way that they've done it. But the result of this is, is that for 40 years, there's been very little change, huge frustrations, huge problems on both sides that don't go away right. and resentments and everything else. And it's not getting any better. So to me, it's okay. like, look at the system and like, talk to me, guys said, get lobbying out of Congress. That would be a great okay, way. So that's, that point is really important, which was, of course, is money in politics. Mm -hmm. Like Now that they have Supreme Court actually forced this in, where they actually allowed money to be equal to free speech, which is an absolute insanity, because you, you're switching votes into money. It's no longer one man one vote it's one dollar one vote. yeah and the you know the other thing is corporations having the same rights as people yeah like, like, except, why is it that they're immortal and and they are by design a sociopath and there it's in, impossible for them to go to jail like right yeah. you know so you you find one of these drug companies three billion dollars and they go okay here's you know write the check no problem like why wasn't the whole top management level up to Board the of director everyone, yeah. jail for 40 years, right? Like, yeah, sir. hello? Yeah. Because, oh, it's not me. It's the company that did it, you know? So we yeah. hide behind this company. Well, it's the collective responsibility, right? The shared responsibility, which means that nobody's really responsible. Yes. Well, we yes. just somehow got there. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Somebody, system, whatever. So the other point that talked to me, no, no, I want to say something important. Right. Say something Which important, Martin. The solution, the solution. Everybody has the solution in their wallet. The solution is that every time I purchase something, I'm voting with my money. So if I'm voting for GMO foods, more of that gets made. If I'm voting for organic foods, more of that 
gets made. If I'm voting for sugar-free, well, whatever it is, just you know the right stuff, you're lifting the producers of the right stuff. So if you're, I'm probably preaching to the choir here. I expect that whoever's watching this is the kind of person that would actually naturally do it. But even I am having at times hesitation of paying the price for everything organic. So I have to remind myself every day, standing at the counter, do I pay 75 cents for the bananas or $1.25 for the banana? Yeah. And banana is not the worst, right? Banana no. is that big a deal, organic or not. But it's a principled thing that uh, is important. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And uh, voting with the dollar is a big part. And then also talking to the uh, councilman at the city hall who are talking to your MLA or your congressman or writing a letter to the president of the United States or the prime minister. I mean, just by having that, just by saying it, you cause them to think a little bit about, well, should we actually do this? Because they assume that you represent a hundred people or a thousand people or 10,000 people. And correctly. And, and correctly, right. And so we need to make, there's been this sort of thing for the last 50 years where like nobody listens. And the truth is, is everybody's listening. And the fact that you're not speaking is what they're listening to the most right now is like, oh, no word. That's great. They don't care. Let's get this through. Let's get that through, right? And sometimes it's hard, like Erin Brockovich with her fight against water. She's still fighting for water all over the United States. And uh, it took a long time before anyone would listen to her. Now, tens of thousands of people are watching her Facebook feed and listening and sharing what yeah. it is that she has to say. And yet, yes, right? Like, 25 years ago, when we had that original problem that put her in spotlight, and just this year we have this horrendous blowout in uh, Flint. Flint, Michigan, and and then I saw her on some talk show, and she says, "Oh man, that's not the only place." And then oh. she starts listing these, whatever place, 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 place where yeah. the stuff I is. I follow her on there. Facebook every day. She's talking about water in some other city. That's really that's bad. Really and it's got this yeah. problem. It's got that problem. It's got this problem. It's an ongoing issue. What happens when we have no good water in the United States and you turn on your tap and it's brown? And and there's no reason for it. I mean, it's not like there's a lack of water or it's not like there's a lack of regulations about the water. It's not like there isn't you know, an engineer who can go into a plant and say, well, you need to fix this and you need to fix that. And then it will clean the water properly instead of not cleaning the water properly. Like, it's just like the things that are going on in well, Flint. are. Just you, you can get me going on this one because we have engineered this whole thing the wrong way. Like we're treating, you know, there should be two waters, right? The water that I'm going to ingest and the water I'm going to use for utility. Like, I should not have to have all water that I'm going to pour on my lawn, wash my clothes with, and whatever else, treated the same way as the water that I'm going to drink. Yes. I think we should have just general rules that all water is gray water unless it's specifically treated for drinking. In which case, we would have the local water outlets, right? Like, my house could be filtered or at least two taps in my house would be filtered. Yes. The school fountain would be filtered, right? And we would all know that, yeah, we don't drink the general water. You don't we drink it out of the hose drinking. anymore. Yeah, well, you drink the drinking water. Yes. Big deal. Yeah. We can learn, right? Yeah. That's talk to me, guys, says water infrastructure is a mess. And it's been allowed to get worse and worse, right? We've got huge improvements in filtration. We've got huge improvements in all these things that we do. And for some, and also in, I believe, in, um, what do you call it when you can monitor, yeah, in the monitoring of it, right? So we can yeah. tell that, oh, yeah, this company over here, uh, it has a leak somewhere because these chemicals are being found long before it's a problem. And we just, we just don't use it. We don't. It's kind of like in the 50s and 60s, they made this thing, and then it was, well, we're going to see how long it lasts before it collapses because we're not going to do any improvements to it. And it's just like, 
man, that's the totally the wrong way to look at it. And what do we do with our waste? I think we'd look at that totally okay. wrong too, right? I think we're going to try and solve everything about everything. I think what we should do at this point is close off our talk about genetically modified foods and decide to talk about other problems of the mankind on another session. Okay. All right. So thank you very much for joining us, everybody. Really appreciate you. Really appreciate having you on with us. Mark, if somebody wants to talk a little bit about, you know what, I've got some problems. I'm not feeling as healthy as I should be. You're the health coach. How should they get a hold of you? Uh, start with the website, life-enthusiast.com or phone, 866-543-3388. Uh, we're also on Skype, life.enthusiast, if you want to reach us that way. Great. Thanks this for is- joining. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, everybody. This is the Life Enthusiast Health Online Radio and TV Network, restoring vitality to you and to the planet. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.